It's a tremendous honor to host tonight Mr. Robert Spencer. Robert is the director of Jihad Watch, a program of the David Horowitz Freedom Center, and the author of 15 books, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Truth About Muhammad, and The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades. His latest book is The Complete Infidel's Guide to Iran. Spencer has led seminars on Islam and Jihad for the FBI, the United States Central Command, the United States Army Command, and General Staff College, the U.S. Army's Asymmetric Warfare Group, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and the U.S. Intelligence Community. Robert has discussed Jihad, Islam, and terrorism at a workshop sponsored by the U.S. State Department and the German Foreign Ministry. He's a tremendous contributor to the education of Americans about the threat of jihad. And uh, what I like most is that he was born in the South uh, and baptized into the Orthodox Church as a young boy and is doing his work prayerfully and for God's sake and for God's glory. Robert, thanks a lot for entertaining this interview. Um, the honor is all mine. Thank you. Would you tell us uh, and our listeners about uh, the conception of your work? How did you begin Jihad Watch? What's its scope and, and what, who are you trying to educate? I began Jihad Watch in October 2003 because I wanted to read it and it didn't exist. Uh, J.D. Salinger, the novelist, said that the, the, book that he, the books he always wrote were the ones he wanted to read, but they weren't there. And so he had to create them. And it was the same thing. I wanted a single depository of news uh, about jihad, a single site where I could find it, plus commentary to make sense of it all. And there wasn't any such thing. So I started it myself. Absolutely nothing. No, there wasn't anything. There were a lot of news sites that contained jihad uh, news, but they had it mixed in with other things and didn't cover all of it. What I was looking for was something that would give the full scope and magnitude of the jihad threat and explain the guiding and motivating ideology behind it. And uh, there it was, Jihad Watch, uh, I think... There was nothing else like that at the time, and really, in a very real sense, there still isn't. For our watchers, would you tell us how would they access your site? It's at jihadwatch, J-I-H-A-D, watch, dot org. Dot uh, com also works, and uh, it's updated many times daily with news and commentary about the jihad threat world. What would they find there? find uh, stories from the mainstream media, mostly, from uh, AP, Reuters, the New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, explaining about various uh, jihad uh, activity around the world and in the United States, but also explaining the biases of those sources in omitting crucial details, in obfuscating the ideology in particular behind the, uh, the, the, the attack in question, and explaining uh, what is the source within the Quran, the Holy Book of Islam, or the life of Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, that gave rise to Muslims thinking that this kind of behavior ought to be pursued, and it was indeed praiseworthy. Hmm. I've seen many times, Robert, on the site, uh, a, a ticker, a counter, I think it's up near 30,000. What, what is that? That is a counter that's actually run by a uh, site that I admire a great deal, the religionofpeace.com, and they offer that counter that is a counter of jihad, lethal jihad attacks since 9-11. And it, as you say, it's nearly 30,000 jihad attacks. This is not casualties. This is jihad attacks that resulted in multiple casualties worldwide. So the number of people killed in jihad since 9-11 is way up over the 30,000. Those are 30,000 separate attacks. 30,000 separate attacks in the last 15 years. In the name of Allah and Islam and Muhammad. Five or six or more every single day of every single year for the last 15 or 16 years. Yes, that's right. And this is not a thorough accounting of jihad. This is what we know of. Exactly. There are some, of course, that we will never we, we will never know about. Some that inevitably the good people at thereligionofpeace.com who do a tremendous job might miss because you can't catch everything. But uh, they do they do uh, very great work. Uh, they keep track. For example, during Ramadan, they kept track 
uh, the recent uh, Muslim month of fasting and devotion, since jihad is considered to be devotion to Allah, uh, I believe upwards of 1,200 people were killed during Ramadan in jihad attacks because the perpetrators think they are serving God when they do this. Yes. Would you tell us a little bit more about jihad? Uh, I think Americans are used to hearing, uh, if they've heard anything about jihad, they're used to hearing that uh, the, the official kind of Muslim line that we hear that the media seems to have picked up, that jihad is about spiritual struggle. That's an interior reality, something like a Christian would be doing to, to try to struggle against sin. What is jihad? Jihad does mean struggle in Arabic, and there are many kinds of struggles. Just like there are many kinds of struggles in English, there are many kinds of jihads. So you can use the word pretty much in any way that you use the English word struggle. The Islamic Republic of Iran has a department of agricultural jihad, and that doesn't have anything to do with war or bombs. It just is trying to, incre to struggle to increase the crop yields. But in Islamic theology, the principal meaning of jihad is warfare against unbelievers in order to subjugate them under the rule of Islamic law. There is a spiritual jihad that is known in Islamic theology as the greater jihad, and the warfare is known as the lesser jihad. However, despite those names, the lesser jihad, that is warfare against unbelievers, is actually the principal and paramount jihad. There is, for example, a manual of Islamic law that is very useful in English called Reliance of the Traveler. And it is a one-volume compendium of the, the contents of Islamic law certified by Al-Azhar, the principal institution in Sunni Islam, as a reliable guide to Sunni orthodoxy. And it devotes half of one paragraph to jihad as spiritual struggle, and then about 12 pages to jihad as warfare, the, how to distribute the spoils of war, the rules for the subjugated people who are conquered in jihad, and so on. And so it's very clear that jihad as warfare is the primary understanding of jihad in Islam. Uh -huh. I'd like you to speak to us a little bit about the relationship between Islam and Christianity. Uh, my sense is that uh, in our nation here in America, we don't have a great understanding of what Islam is. Uh, I was reminded of this very recently when I was uh, speaking to uh, a fellow who uh, we were discussing Islam, and he was aware of the fact that I had in my church uh, quite um, uh, a nice contingent of Arab Orthodox Christians. And he said to me, oh, they must have all converted from Islam to Christianity. <laughs> and uh, and I thought, I told him, I said, you know, forgive me, but Islam is the Johnny come lately here. Our people were, were Christians for 600 years um, before Islam was even on the scene. I think, however, that kind of uh, historical ignorance is quite common. And I'm wondering if you can help us. I know that we've had 14 centuries of Christian-Muslim relations ever since Muslims poured out of the Arabian Peninsula shortly after the death of Muhammad. And they invaded the Christian empire and without being invited, uh, murdered and plundered their way into capturing more than half of the Roman Empire uh, in a very, very short period of time. How did the Christian church initially react to the Islamic presence? By uh, finding themselves in a war. I mean, this was something that came as a total surprise. In the uh, 7th century, in the 630s, shortly after the traditional date that is ascribed to uh, Muhammad's death, 632, the Arab armies swept out of Arabia and conquered Christian lands. Egypt, which was completely Christian, North Africa, Syria, and on up into Zoroastrian Persia and into India. And uh, Sophronius, the patriarch of Jerusalem, actually writes quite extensively about the invaders and how rapacious and brutal and violent they were, how they destroyed and despoiled churches. And uh, interestingly enough, he says absolutely nothing about their having a new religion or a new uh, prophet or a new holy book. And there seems to be quite a bit of... Uh, uh, reason to question the historicity of the standard uh, account of the origins of Islam. But by the beginning of the 8th century, uh, Islam was beginning to be known, and St. John of Damascus spoke about it, uh, wrote about it quite extensively as a Christian heresy, mm. because the Quran denies the, it speaks uh, quite a bit about Jesus, but it's really only uh, Jesus as the Muslim prophet who bears witness to the coming of Muhammad. 
and denies the, the Quran denies the incarnation, denies the divinity of Christ, denies the Trinity, denies the crucifixion, and hence also, of course, the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And John of Damascus notes all this, but notes that the presence of Jesus and the Blessed Mother in the uh, Quran is an indication that it was a Christian heresy, and I think it did develop from some Christian heresies, particularly Nestorianism and Christian Gnosticism, as for, well as for Judaism. For our listeners, I, I want to reiterate something you just said. You've mentioned two major, major figures in the Orthodox world. The first is the great patriarch and Saint Sophronius of Jerusalem, who, if I'm not mistaken, actually turned over the key of Jerusalem to uh, the caliph when he invaded the, uh, the city. Well, you know, Father, that story is very famous, but it's almost certainly historically inaccurate. Is that right? Yes. Uh, there may never have been a Caliph Umar. Sophronius, in his own writings, of which quite a few are available now, he never mentions Umar. And yet, uh, it would seem as if there would be, I mean, it's an argument from silence, but it does seem an odd omission, since he spoke so extensively about the, uh, the invaders. Right, and his opinion about was them, wrote about uh, them. very, very influential. This is the, the propagator of the life of St. Mary of Egypt. This is a writer of spiritual councils, uh, John Mos Moskus' spiritual meadow. This is a tremendously influential and educated bishop, saint. Uh, Patriarch Sophronius, and our listeners may be interested to know that this is also the patron saint of one of the great contemporary elders in Orthodoxy, Elder Sophronius of Essex, uh, the biographer and spiritual son of St. Siloam the Athenite. So his, uh, his opinion of uh, Verli Islam would be extremely influential, I would think, in the Orthodox world. And St. John Damascus, you mentioned, who was bilingual in Greek and Arabic, I remember reading in his, uh, his commentary uh, on the Muslim forces, he, he was uh, very shall I say, sharp. He said that uh, Muhammad was Antichrist and that uh, the surahs were silly. Yes, he, he was very, uh, absolutely unyielding and uh, very clear that this was not, as one would say in the modern parlance, one of our three great Abrahamic faiths. Uh, uh -huh. St. John of Damascus gives, uh -huh. and St. Sophronius, neither one of them give any hint that they viewed it that way. They thought that it was a, a tremendously evil force that had caused great harm to the church. Was the opinion of St. Sophronius and St. John of Damascus um, discarded, or is there a consistency in the approach that the Christian Church took to Islam in the succeeding centuries? The Church was completely consistent in its reaction to Islam. Islam, after all, with all those denials, then also mandates warfare against and the subjugation of Christians. And the Church had to fight wars to, to, to defend, uh, defend itself. Constantinople was put under siege the first time in the year 711. And the uh, church had to defend itself from Islam for centuries and never thought that it was anything but a force, as St. John of Damascus said, that was Antichrist. Mm -hmm. But in modern times, that has all changed. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, anyone who dares to think that there might be anything negative about Islam is on the outs with uh, significant portions of the church. Could you talk to us more about that? When did this change uh, in the Christian evaluation of Islam take place. I, I, for instance, have been quite amazed at some of the commentary uh, that I've heard and seen from Pope Francis. Uh, I also remember seeing um, many, many years ago uh, the late Pope John Paul II actually enter into a mosque and kiss a copy of the Quran, which was... Uh, Forgive me, a very offensive act to, to, to me. Uh, I as, agree to our, wholeheartedly. To our Orthodox forebears. Um, did, is this a, a, a mid 20th century phenomenon from the ecumenical movement? When did this change? Is that it did start in the 60s. Of course, it had antecedents, or the 60s would not have exploded with such silliness all over the world. But certainly that was when it, they did, it all did explode, and the Second Vatican Council in the Catholic Church was uh, the occasion for the uh, document Nostra Aetate, which affirms that uh, it was uh, the, the Vatican, Second Vatican Council was an attempt to put a positive face on ecumenical relations and uh, stress everything that we had in common with non-Christians of various, uh, various different faiths. And it said, we esteem uh, the Muslims, they adore with us the one true God, and they profess to hold the faith of Abraham. Uh, and from that statement, all these recent 
papal statements have come uh, based on that. I think a great deal has been made, a great deal more than was warranted about the idea that together with us, the Muslims worship the one true God. And I think even that is highly debatable in light of the fact that the God in the Quran, Allah in the Quran, he... Uh, he says, for example, in chapter 32, verse 13, uh, if we had willed, he always speaks of himself in the royal we, if we had willed, we would have brought all men to the truth, but instead we will fill hell with jinns and men. That is not the God of the Bible, mm -hmm. who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. And, the, uh, of course, the New Testament also tells us that he who does not have the Son does not have the Father, and the Quran reminds us many times that Jesus that is not the Son of God, and it is, a, is in fact, it is uh, an insult to the transcendent majesty of God to say that he has a Son. And so, uh, there are many, many other things. Chapter 91, verse 7 of the Quran says that uh, Allah places both good and evil in the heart. And so, that's a complete departure from the Christian idea that people are good until they turn away from God, yes. and that evil is not something God gives us, but something that we have from rejecting God. Mm. And so, in any case, uh, this, this all was swept aside, and uh, the, the idea that the, the Catholic Church said that, uh, that we have the same God was somehow taken in many quarters of the Catholic Church to mean that uh, we shouldn't evangelize among Muslims, we should not criticize when they kill Christians, hmm. we should pursue a dialogue that is per being pursued on the Christian side resolutely with the eyes shut. And uh, I was even once actually canceled from speaking at a Catholic conference where I was scheduled to speak by the local bishop who said that to speak about the Muslim persecution of Christians would harm the dialogue that we're having, which in other words was tantamount to saying the dialogue is not going to touch on the issues it should be touching on. Yeah, it's just going to be a, a, a nice fest with yes. where we, we get together and have chicken and pita and hummus and 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 and. and talk about how much we like each other, and that's all. But this dialogue has not saved one Christian from being persecuted. It's not saved one church from being destroyed. Mm -hmm. And it's drastically misleading, and it's only been made worse by these papal statements, the kissing of the Quran, and then Pope Francis's recent statement that the authentic Islam and the proper understanding of the Quran reject all sorts, all kinds of violence, which is flatly false and misleading, and, and misleading to people in a harmful way. Mm. I'm wondering, I've often thought that uh, our people, our Orthodox Christian people in the West, have a unique role to play in contributing to the education of Westerners about life with Islam. Uh, Islam arose in the East. Uh, its first contacts were with Orthodox Christians. We've lived for 14 centuries, sometimes better, sometimes worse, with our Islamic neighbors. Uh, and now there are many Orthodox Christians here in America who can bear witness to a, a, an authentic reality of what's possible uh, and what's not possible with regards to Christian coexistence with Islam. And I, I'm wondering if you would speak a little bit to that and to this idea of uh, what it's been like for Christians to live under Muslim domination for the last 14 centuries, as Islam, uh, at least until the middle of the 19th century, had a pretty strong uh, pro-Western uh, success rate in conquering Western countries, especially the Ottomans through the Balkans, threatening Western Europe several times. Um, what would you say, Robert, is the best case scenario in that 14th century history? What, where would you point, point us to to say this was the best case for, for Christians and what was that like and some of the worst case scenarios? The best case was 1856, the year 1856, when uh, the British and French governments pressured the Ottoman Empire, uh, which needed their help in their conflict with Russia over Crimea. They pressured the Ottoman Empire to abolish the Dimma. The Dimma is the contract of protection, uh, that, as it's known, uh, that uh, stipulates that the Christians are allowed to live in the Islamic State as long as they accept various humiliating and discriminatory regulations. They pay a tax. They cannot hold authority over Muslims, so they can only hold the most menial of jobs. They uh, cannot build new churches or repair old ones, so their communities are always declining. Uh, they have to step off the sidewalk if a Muslim is coming. They cannot build their buildings higher than that of the Muslims. All sorts of things. In some cases, they even had to wear uh, an insignia. Uh, like the, the, the Jews in Nazi Germany, so that the Muslims would know that they were not to greet them as fellow Muslims with peace be upon you, but with rather with peace be upon those who are rightly guided. In other words, peace be upon the Muslims only. And uh, may also have uh, signaled that they could be abused in various ways. 
these things were all abolished uh, under Western pressure in 1856. The idea that Christians should not be equal citizens was uh, still very much present in the society. And even in countries where Islamic law is not enforced to this day, there is no Muslim-majority country where Christians have equal rights. But after the abolition of the, the, the contract of protection, the Dimma, in 1856, Christians in Turkey did uh, attain a measure of, uh, or I should say, not, not even close to equality, but certainly improved conditions. And then that led also uh, to this abolition of the Dimma in Egypt and uh, around the Islamic world and the secular Arab nationalist regimes that followed the collapse of the empire uh, were generally better for the Christians. But whenever Islamic law is enforced, those same provisions come into to play again. And now ISIS, the Islamic State that claims to be the new caliphate, ha has restored them and has either killed or exiled the Christians and those that remain in its domains are paying this tax and accepting this sex so subjugated if status. if I hear you right, you're, you're asserting that vimitude was a consistent reality where Islamic law was prevailing. And the best case scenario you're giving me is middle of the 19th century, due to Western pressure, Christians were able to get out from some of the oppressive legislation associated with their uh, dhimma. Exactly. Where Islamic law is enforced, th all those regulations are still part of Islam. Uh -huh. And even in the case of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, even the case of Turkey, that didn't last. If I'm correct, your own family suffered uh, a backlash uh, not, not a century later. Could you t tell us more about that? Absolutely. In the, uh, after the independence of Greece in 1821, the Ottoman Empire was under tremendous pressure from the Christian minorities, Greeks and Armenians and others, but primarily Greeks and Armenians, in Turkey, in, in, in Anatolia or Asia Minor. Uh, the Greeks in Western Asia Minor, which is where my family was from, in Sesmes near Smyrna, they wanted independence and to, or, or actually to join up with independent Greece. So they were considered Kufar Harbi, infidels at war with Islam. So were the Armenians for wanting an Armenian state. And so, uh, even when the Ottoman Empire fell, uh, the, uh, even the secular Turks thought that they were uh, incompatible with their notion of a secular Turkey in which a depoliticized Islamic identity would still be part of the hallmark of Turkish nationality. And so, either way, either the Muslim clerics were saying they were Kufar Harbi, and the secular Turks were saying that they were not part of the new Turkish state and had no place there. So, uh, in the, the persecution was ongoing and uh, sporadic. Uh, of course, there was the, the terrible massacres in Smyrna in 1923, and my family actually left the area five years before that, uh, when uh, they... Uh, uh, were invited to accept Islam and declined the invitation, and then it's just uh, uh, get out or, or be killed. And they did kill my great-grandfather on the way out, but the rest of the family was able to get out. Incredible. This is a common story for, for us Orthodox people. Yes. You've mentioned uh, the Dhimma and the, the, st the state of Dhimmitude. We hear a lot these days also about Sharia, and especially about uh, immigrants, Muslim immigrants who have come to Western Europe and to the United States, uh, very attached to Sharia and uh, agitating, polit politically agitating for uh, independent Sharia courts, uh, for a bifurcated judicial system that would allow them to uh, follow Islamic law. What is Sharia? Tell us what that is. Sharia is Islamic law. It's considered to be the unalterable and perfect law of Allah. And so it is not just religious law. It's not just law governing uh, various ceremonial observances or rituals or uh, personal piety. It is a political and social system that co governs every aspect of life. There is no conceivable human endeavor that does not have a Sharia law governing it. And so that means it's a law for societies. It's the, and because it's perfect and divine, it is considered to be preferable to and superior to all man-made political systems. And Muslims have a responsibility to wage jihad in order to replace those non-Muslim political systems with the rule of Islamic law. This is the jihad imperative. The goal of jihad is not just to kill people or blow things up, but it is to weaken the infidel political systems so that one day they will collapse and can be replaced with Sharia. Uh -huh. So this is not... Uh an occasional interest. This is at the heart of Islam, and uh, it's natural, we might even say, for Islam, Islamic immigrants 
uh, if they come to a country and they're not inspired to come there because of the political system, uh, but they're coming maybe because of some other uh, less grandiose uh, intention, like prosperity, uh, financial prosperity, or to escape violence in their own home countries. It would be understandable why they would be agitating for Sharia in Western countries. Well, see, the Quran says, you are the best of people on earth, it says this to the Muslims. You are the best of people in joining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. So, the notion that Muslims are the best of people is inextricably tied in that verse, which is chapter 3, verse 110, to... Uh, the idea that they enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. Uh -huh. In other words, the Muslims are the best of people because they know the legal code by which we all must live, yes. and we do not. And the unbelievers, on the other hand, are like animals. That's chapter 8, verse 55. They're most vile of created beings. Chapter 98, verse 6, all these quotes from the Quran. So, you have an immigrant group now for the first time in American history coming to the United States with a ready-made model of society and governance that they consider superior to the one they are coming to. And many of them are determined to replace the one with the other. Yes. That's compounded by the notion of emigration in Islam. Chapter 4, verse 100 of the Quran promises rewards from Allah for those who emigrate in the cause of Allah, which would mean going to a new place and dying there, but emigrating not just for material prosperity, but to bring Islam to the new land. Uh -huh. And that is a great meritorious act in Islam. Yes, I was not surprised when uh, in the la late sad events in December, on December 2nd in San Bernardino, not far from where I live, uh, we had the, at that time, second most violent terrorist attack in America uh, when uh, these young uh, Muslim, young people, attacked and, and murdered many and wounded many. Um, I was not surprised to find in the investigation that followed that uh, Rizwan Farouk, his mother, the murderer's mother, had just received her certificate for the caliphate. She had done a caliphate studies class and had just received her certificate. And I, th I thought to myself, what is this woman doing here in the United States if she believes in the caliphate and wants the caliphate? What is she doing? She here? wants to bring it here? Yes, evidently. Evidently. One of your books addresses uh, the Crusades. Uh, and it's vogue today, especially on our American campuses, to criticize uh, Christianity vociferously, especially for uh, colonization uh, in North Africa and the Middle East, uh, and to criticize uh, Christ the Christian faith for the Crusades. I have always found this to be uh, extremely shocking since the Crusades were a, a very limited uh, reconquest attempt to try to take back the most precious lands to Christians, the Holy Land, where Jesus was born, worked his miracles, died for the salvation of the world, rose again and ascended to heaven. Um, and when those lands were stolen by the violent uh, aggression of Islam in the seventh century, that Christians would want them back and would uh, attempt to get them back by the Crusades seems like a reasonable thing to me, forgive me for that. That's not to justify uh, violent atrocities that were uh, uh, on both sides during the Crusades. But help me understand, since you know a lot about the Crusades, um, why is it that the Christians are so criticized for the Crusades, which was, uh, I would say, an aberrant, short-lived project that is understandable politically since our lands had been stolen from us and these are our most precious lands. Why is it that we're so strenuously criticized whereas Islam has been on a perpetual 14th century crusade to take lands that are not theirs and we aren't criticizing them? Well, Islam also is the only religion that is uh, actively engaged in deceptive tactics to, uh, to foster the jihad against the West they are actively whitewashing the history of Islam, meanwhile trying to tarnish the history of Christianity so that Westerners, particularly young people, are demoralized and think, well, there's no reason to defend this. It's, it's rotten, and the invaders are noble, and uh, uh, we should embrace them. In reality, of course, the Crusades, as you say, were a late and small-scale response to 450 years of jihad that had destroyed, had conquered and Islamized what had been half of the Christian world before that time. 
And yet, if you were to ask the, the, uh, an average college student, they would know all about the Crusades as a terrible, rapacious exercise in colonialism and oppression but probably would never have heard of those jihads and never even knew, perhaps, that Egypt and Syria and uh, all those areas were Christian. Right. Uh, pro if, or if, if they did know that, they have, have been taught that these people embraced Islam willingly, uh, when actually uh, Islam has a very poor record for convincing people of the light of its truth and goodness. Uh, the way that in which Egypt was Islamized was by making life so miserable for the Christians that they ultimately, most of them, converted because that was the only thing you need to, needed to do to get away from paying the tax and uh, suffering all the other systematic, uh, uh, systematic uh, uh, principles that oppressed the Christians that I outlined before. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about our nation today and the sense that I think is common now in our country uh, that... Uh, we are insecure. Ever since the 1960s, when, uh, as an expression, I think, of taking religion less seriously, especially religion um, in the public square, we altered our immigration laws and stripped them of their religious teeth, as though a person's religion isn't going to be intimately connected with their politics. As a result of that, in the United States, we have seen increased numbers of non-Christian immigrants, although because of our geography, still the majority of our immigrants are coming from Christian countries, Latin American countries, Southeast Asian countries, uh, so that it, it, the immigrants for this last uh, 40, 50 years have not been uh, as violently disruptive to American life as perhaps the immigrants uh, have been in France, Germany, England, where such a large percentage of those immigrants are Muslims. And now we have major enclaves in all of those countries that are predominantly Muslim, where many of the uh, traditional peoples don't even go. Uh, police forces av avoid and uh, separate law systems are in force. Um, we have uh, London becoming Londinistan and not so yet in America, but we're feeling different these days since 9-11. I don't think there's many Americans today who think that they're safer today than they were before 9-11, despite all the efforts that we've made as a nation to try to protect our people. 15 years after 9-11, and it's worse than ever. We have terrorists in our midst. They're striking on all coasts. Um, and our current leadership appears to most, I believe, not to have a tenable plan, a successful, workable plan to uh, obtain security for Americans again. And my question to you is, is a, a practical one. I want you to imagine that you're the president of the United States. Okay, <laughs> I vote for you. You're the president of the United States. What would you do by way of practical policy initiatives to secure our nation against terrorism while protecting our civil freedoms? I would restore some of the old immigration laws that did make reference to religion and to religious practice. Theodore Roosevelt restricted immigration from, of, of polygamists and people who advocated or believed in polygamy, which would ban Muslims from the United States. Now, I'm not talking about banning Muslims from the United States, but certainly in a time when there is uh, no way to distinguish a, a peaceful refugee from a potential jihadi. It's unwise in the extreme to be bringing in large numbers of Muslims. And so I would end immigration from uh, Muslim countries, particularly ones like Saudi Arabia, uh, Pakistan, where there are large numbers of jihadis. I would uh, reconfigure our international alliances such that the sham alliances that we have with countries like Pakistan and Turkey that are holdovers from uh, the Cold War would be ended. We've been giving billions of dollars to Pakistan, well over a billion every year since 9-11, for them to fight al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Most of that money the Pakistani government has given to al-Qaeda and the Taliban. This is a ridiculous situation. It should have been stopped years ago. Uh, Turkey is the same way. It's rapidly re-Islamizing, uh, discarding its secular government, 
and supporting is, ISIS. Supporting ISIS. It's no friend of the United States. Refused John Kerry's request to stop ISIS's oil sales and so on. And uh, there's no reason why we should consider Turkey an ally at this point. We need new alliances with nations that are fighting the same jihad we are. And uh, that means India, even Russia, although Russia's alliance with, Al- with Iran is very troubling. Uh, China, to be sure. And people would say, well, why, how could we ally with these terrible states? Well, Pakistan is just as oppressive in its own way as China is uh, of Christians and of uh, non-Muslim religious expression. Uh, the, the, and also the idea when we're talking about uh, being president of the United States, we can't always find people with white hats who are sinless. Uh, in this world. Uh, we allied with Stalin to fight against Hitler, and I don't know why we couldn't ally with Putin to fight against the Jihad, mm-hmm. but he would have to be consistent about it in fighting the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran as well. Sure. Uh, we need domestically to... Yeah, speak about the domestic scene. What about our neighbors? What about uh, good Muslim Americans who are here? Mm-hmm. And uh, they're feeling very torn. Uh, what about that? What do we do? of mosques in the United States have been shown by four separate and independent surveys since 1998 to be teaching hatred of Jews and Christians and the necessity ultimately to replace uh, the Constitution with Islamic law. So they need to be monitored. They need to be required to institute programs that would teach against the understanding of Islam that is offered by al-Qaeda and ISIS. There should be no problem with this because they condemn al-Qaeda and ISIS and they say they have nothing to do with them. So back up your words with deeds and teach your young people not that all this is wrong and they, they must not do it. And uh, any activity toward uh, implementing any aspect of Sharia that is contradictory to U.S. constitutional principles should be considered a criminal act. Yes. And then uh, I think that we would find that the problem would uh, be significantly reduced. Much of what is happening now is happening because our leaders are allowing it and enabling it. And if we only had leaders who stood up, then uh, we would find, as is so often the case with evil, that it is not as formidable as it seemed to be. I was shocked last December after this terrible terrorist attack here in Southern California. I was shocked that our president did not come here. We were waiting for him. I fully expected to see him the next day, or at least a day or two later. Uh, It was weeks before he flew in on a way to a vacation in Hawaii and had secret, you know, quiet off uh, the public meetings with a number of families. Instead, he chose uh, the very next day to go to a mosque in Baltimore and to meet with the Muslims and to assure them. It was a surreal experience. It was as though Muslims had been attacked by American terrorists instead of Americans being attacked by Muslim terrorists. It was complete reversal. Absolutely left me uh, in an altered state. One of the presuppositions of our secular elite that is repeated ad nauseum is that all religion is the same. All religion promotes peace. All religion is for goodness and comforting human beings, as though it doesn't matter if the religion's founder prayed for the forgiveness of his enemies while they were sticking nails through his hands and feet, or if the religion's founder died after helping to decapitate 800 men with his own hands. Really? Are are we that stupid, Robert? This is what I'm asking. Are we that stupid? Why are so many American leaders... Not just politicians, from whom we might expect such. Politicians and religious leaders, why are we so committed to nonsense speak when it comes to Islam? What is in it for them to talk this way? Why do they want to talk this way? Why float this totally false construct called Islamophobia and lend credence to a false narrative that downplays Muslim association with terrorism and turns the community producing these terrorists into the victims? Why? I think there's several reasons why. One is they really do underestimate the problem. They may not really believe the nonsense that they speak about Islam being a religion of peace. But I do think that generally we are governed today 
by post-religious secular materialists who not only are not religious themselves, but don't even understand the power of the religious impulse. And so when they see Muslims saying that they did this for Allah and for Islam, they think, well, they must really have some other reason because nobody really takes that sort of thing seriously. It's really just a cover for their poverty, and if we give them money, then this problem will go away. Uh, I think many of them really do believe that. And other also, others also, I think, they, uh, they may know very well that what they're saying is false, but they actually want to encourage the Muslim immigration and the concomitant terrorism in the United States. Now, that is a very serious charge, but it's, it actually goes along with the fact that there is a globalist imperative, an attempt to uh, break down national bound boundaries and to uh, encourage massive immigration, essentially with the goal of making every given area just like every other area. And then the idea is quite utopian that there'll be no more war because there won't be any reason for war because material goods will be pretty much evenly distributed. Every place will be just as dangerous and just as dirty as every other place. Nobody will have any reason to fight. I think that there, is, there are people who believe in that way, who are very powerful and very influential. And so, there are some who I believe are irretrievably naive and really do think that Islam is a religion of peace, but others who have an agenda that's quite a bit more sinister. What about the Muslim lobby itself here in America? Uh, after the terrorist attack in San Bernardino last December, uh, CARE was on the scene immediately and prepped... Um, uh, mostly everyone who was going to speak on behalf of the Muslim community. And we heard the same rhetoric. And uh, CARE seems so invested in promoting this whole Islamophobia stick. What about the Muslims themselves? Why are they doing this? Well, CARE, remember, the Council on American Islamic Relations, is a group that has been linked by the Justice Department, or the Justice Department rather has. Uh, certified the links that CARE has to Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood, according to a captured internal document that was discovered a few years back during the trial of the Holy Land Foundation, which at that time, up to that time, had been the largest Islamic charity in the United States, but then was shut down for funneling charitable contributions to the terror group Hamas. The Holy Land Foundation trial uh, resulted in the release of a great many documents that they had in their offices. And one of them was an internal document of the Brotherhood that outlined the Brotherhood's uh, goal for the United States, strategic goal for conquering the United States, and said that the brothers must understand, and I quote, the brothers must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers, that is, by the hands of the Westerners themselves and the hands of the Muslims, by their hands and the hands of the believers, so that it falls and Allah's religion is victorious over other religions. And so their campaign, their work in America, is a work of subversion and sabotage and getting Americans themselves to work against their own interests. Now, you see that document and read it, and then see what CARE does in opposing every counter-terror measure that's ever been proposed or implemented, yes, and in shaming Americans who oppose jihad terror and stigmatizing them as bigots and racists and Islamophobes. They are very, very skillfully carrying out exactly that program of sabotaging the United States and doing it by the hands of Americans themselves, the enlightened people who think that Islam is a religion of peace and that to think otherwise is Islamophobia, and that to resist jihad terror is Islamophobia. There was a plot a few years back in Fort Dix in New Jersey, and it was foiled by a young man who worked in a video store. And he, the jihadis came in and asked him to transfer their jihad videos to, from VHS to DVD. In the course of doing this job, he saw all this blood and gore and bloodlust and violence and hatred, and he was quite alarmed and thought these men might be up to no good. Of course, he was quite right. And he went to his manager and he said, I'm seeing some very strange things on these videos. Should I go to the police or would that be racist? And that he even hesitated long enough. He did ultimately go to the police and the plot was foiled and the men are in jail. But that he hesitated for a second and thought it was racist is an indication of how effective CARE has been and its allied groups. And that is the work of sabotaging its miserable house. Uh -huh. And it's worked. Yes, it has.
Yes, it has. You know, in our own world here uh, in Southern California, following the December terrorist attack, I attended a, uh, a meeting, uh, an ecumenical meeting, uh, that my city, the city of Riverside, sponsored. Uh, it was really hosted by the leadership of the local mosque, uh, where the murderer worshipped for years. Uh, and the goal of it was to uh, establish relations, air out feelings, etc. And when I went there, I spoke with the spiritual director of the mosque. And uh, he began to, to tell me the things that I often hear from Muslims, that this has nothing to do with Islam, that jihad's about internal warfare, that they're very sorry about all this and they're against it, etc. And I asked him this question. <coughs> I said, look, the Orthodox community in America is roughly the same size as the Muslim community. Maybe 2,500 churches, maybe 2,500 mosques, around there. I said, look, if in our Orthodox churches in America we had produced hundreds of young men who were traveling across the world to fight uh, in a terrorist organization like ISIS, if numerous of our churches had been tagged by uh, the intelligence community in America as fostering terrorism, if we had numerous terrorist attacks executed by Orthodox believers from our churches, I would recognize, and, th and that this had been going on for 15 years, I would recognize that we are either not communicating our message, if the message didn't include that, uh, or we were communicating and there was some major gap between the clergy and what we were teaching and the, and the young people in the pews, although we don't have pews. So I asked him, I said, where, my friend, is your curriculum? Where is your curriculum? And he looked at me, the spiritual director of the mosque, where this terrorist was. And by the way, this was not the first terrorist from this mosque. Two had already been arrested four years prior. Yes. And, and he said, well, we're not doing a very good job at that. And I said, well, why not? Where is your curriculum that teaches that true Islam from this passage in the Quran and this passage in the Quran and from these hadith makes it very clear that violence against non-Muslims is immoral and sinful and that people who attack people and murder them in innocent blood go to hell. Where is that curriculum? He had nothing to say to me. He had nothing to say to you because there is no such teaching in the Quran or the Hadith that are considered authentic by Muslims. Islam has doctrines of violence against unbelievers. These things are there. This is why there is no program in any mosque in the country to teach against the ISIS understanding of Islam, because the ISIS understanding of Islam is based strictly on the Quran and Muhammad. The only way that Muslims might be peaceful is by not being devout, not paying attention to what's in the texts, not reading the texts and being aware of what's in them, which is entirely possible since most Muslims don't speak Arabic, but you have to pray and read the Quran in Arabic. Yes. And so many Muslims have, I, I remember once I was speaking to a Pakistani Muslim and he said, I am very proud of my religion and I have memorized almost all of the Quran. And one day I'm going to get one of those translations and find out what it means. Uh -huh. And so it's entirely possible. And of course, there are many Muslims who are fine people. And I suspect that the correlation between Muslims who are fine people and Muslims who don't know or care what's in the Quran is very high. Because if you are a believer and you read the Quran and the life of Muhammad and, and, and the rest of the Hadith, then you're going to see that you are exhorted to commit acts of violence. There was a young man in North Carolina who was not religious. He was Iranian, but he had grown up in a very unreligious family. And when he went to college at the University of North Carolina, he uh, was drinking and smoking marijuana and uh, all these things that college students generally do. And then he thought, I'm wasting my life. I'm spending my life dissipate in dissipation and debauchery. And he repented. And he thought, I'm going to get back to my religion. And he got a Quran and started to read it. And after he read it, he rented an SUV and drove it on campus to try to run over as many non-Muslim students as he could. He injured nine. He wasn't able to kill anyone. And, and he was, at that point, stopped. Then, when he was in prison, he wrote a series of six letters to the campus newspaper explaining in tremendous detail why he did what he did. His name is Muhammad Reza Tahiri Azhar. And he wrote extensive quotes from the Quran, explaining that he had not read the Quran, he did not know much about Islam, but when he read it, he saw that it, the greatest act was to wage jihad against unbelievers, and he thought that would make up for all the life he had, all the time he had spent in sin. Hmm. 
Goodness gracious. It was right there in the book. Your work is of extreme value Thank to, you very much. to America. And very, very proud of your work and to know you. Likewise. And, and I thank God for your diligence. I thank God that you're doing this in love and that you're doing this with uh, great devotion. And I ask that the Jihad Watch would serve the educational purpose you want it to, so that with the knowledge of what is right and what is true, we can make wise decisions and ensure a peaceful life for us, which is what we want here in our land. Thank you so much, Robert, for, Thank you, Father. for the interview. Thank you, Father.